afternoon um, or otherwise, wherever you're tuning in from. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got Rafael Begay with us tonight, and uh, we're very excited to have him um, doing a talk on Danae being through seeing uh, and seeing through storytelling. Uh, just go through our... Land acknowledgement. Sorry, I've got to get rid of my screen. Uh, the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people whose traditional homelands our institution sits. Our work would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and honor ancestral descendants indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful uh, to all indigenous peoples and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Um, and uh, again, we are a nonprofit, so we um, are, are always very grateful for the support of everyone like you on Webinar World um, to support our mission. A uh, quick reminder, I know we're getting back into the uh, webinar season here. Um, so if you do have any questions throughout the chat or throughout the talk, um, avoid the chat and throw them into the Q&A um, just so they don't get lost. And I'll make sure that I'm monitoring that and Taylor will help me with that. Um, we are live streaming on Facebook and then we do have a YouTube channel um, that you can see this uh, webinar and past webinars as soon as it is posted as well. Um, next week, we've got another uh, creative person doing an artist talk. Um, Anna Sorepius, I think is the name. I'm sorry if I butchered that. I have a Finnish last name and uh, I've gone through that my entire life too. So I'm, I apologize, Anna, if you're there, but we're, uh, we're very much looking forward to that talk next week. And then the following week, we've got a uh, talk about um, Towards a History of American Indian and Jewish Relations with Dr. David Kaufman. So please join us for those as well. Uh, this webinar series, just like all of our mission, um, isn't possible without the generous donations of viewers like you. Um, if you want to consider supporting us, there's a QR code here and I'll just leave this up for a brief minute in case anybody wants to get out their phones and uh, donate. Okay, our uh, 2023 annual report for our research project out at the Haney site is now available. Um, you can learn about finding the overlapping pit structures in different uh, time periods of occupation. Uh, read about how bison bone analysis has narrowed down the site habitation. Um, and also understand how people lived at Haney um, and how they modified that space over time. That's at crowcanyon.org backslash site reports database list. Um, and there is also a QR code there if you are interested. Folks have been working very hard on that and um, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but I'm really looking forward to scanning over that report. Okay, a intro for Raphael. Uh, Raphael Begay is a visual storyteller based in the Navajo Nation. Informed by cultural teaching and land-based knowledge, he activates cultural landscape photography and oral storytelling uh, traditions to document and celebrate the Diné way of life. His work focuses on the relationship between his Diné relatives and their surroundings, as well as the ways um, his work, um, is, I'm sorry, as well as his way that the work act, acts as a steward of love, language, and memory. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Raphael and let him take it away. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jonas. Yeah, no One moment as I share my screen.
Uh, yeah, it's Ed. Um, thank you very much for joining uh, for us today for the Net Being and Seeing Through Storytelling. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started here, share some images, as well as some memories, stories, and teachings that I've learned, engaged, and embodied throughout um, the past 32 years of my life. Um, for my Diné relatives out there and those who are joining us today, uh, um, hello everyone. I am, my name is Ralphie Alpigay. I am one who walks around. I am born for the Red House people. My maternal grandfather's clan is Water's Edge and my paternal grandfather's clan is Salt People. I'm originally from Hunters Point, Arizona and live in Rinder Rock, Arizona, which happens to be the capital of the Navajo Nation. Uh, pictured here on the right is uh, a view from Hunters Point. It is about a good hour hike to the top of this geological feature. Um, and below where that spire is at is sort of where my relatives are and further down the road, um, my family homestead. Uh, the picture below that is a um, view of Rinder Rock from the back end on a trailhead that accesses the actual opening within the Rinder Rock. Um, it's just as the sun is setting and sort of the inner arc is glowing with a beautiful light. And I thought I'd just share um, some brief visuals of where I come from, and who I am as a Diné person. I'd also like to acknowledge that today is the um, birthday of my late grandmother, Marie Tabaha. And with that, I also like to acknowledge my late grandfather, Rafael Tabaha, who I'm named after. And with respect to my grandparents, my parents and my relatives, I just wanted to um, share that space and sort of bring that energy to today's presentation. So as mentioned, I am a visual storyteller based on the Navajo Nation. And I believe my work um, up to this point has been focused on four particular themes. Uh, the first being Kea or the land. Second, Hoan, home. Third, Keh or kinship and last Ina life. With respect to Kea or land, the Navajo Nation is the largest sovereign nation in the United States, uh, both by population with over 400,000 enrolled tribal members, as well as land base with over 27,000 square miles spanning across New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. Um, my community and my, my relatives reference it as Denebekeya, it is the land upon which the people stand. Um, and it is my home. It is where I'm speaking from today. And it is as a, a renowned image and sensibility about it, as well as pictured here in terms of uh, an image of Monument Valley, which is this renowned visual of the Navajo Nation. Um, I am one who walks around and as a photographer, I do exactly that. I walk around and venture to different parts of the reservation in hopes of documenting, preserving, and activating the space and time with respect to the visual image. Um, and from that, I speak from a very personal experience. I look at home, or at least Kea, the land as a place between red dirt and blue skies. And we are the light and the connection between those two. Um, and that's by way of story, memory, and our backyard. Um, this, to begin our presentation today, this is an image titled My Backyard, and it is created in Hunters Point, Arizona. It is location. It is the location where I visited back when I was um, in the middle school newspaper as a young teen. And it was the first photograph that I created <clears throat> at the time that made me realize the power and the magic of the photographic image. And when beginning um, this new series at the time of vernacular response, I did exactly the same thing I did when I was a young teen. I ventured back to my homestead, to Hunter's Point, to Sinish Chi, to this particular spot and recreated that moment of when I first took my first photograph. Um, and it's from this space that I'd like to share and a lot of 
my foundation lies here as a Diné creator. It is sort of the beginning in my sense of an origin story. Um, pictured here is uh, Spider Rock in Sayet or Canyon de Shea National Monument, um, just east of Chinle, Arizona. Um, I would look at land as sacred, land as history, land as knowledge, and land as stewardship. With respect to this particular site, um, there is the shared stewardship of the National Monument with the National Park Service, as well as Navajo Nation Parks and Recreation. But beyond those two entities, something that has existed longer than that has been the origin stories and the teachings found from Spider Rock. And with respect to the winter storytelling months, um, this is the place and the, the home dwelling of Spider Woman who shared her knowledge, her techniques with the Diné and taught them how to weave and the different designs that they could source from. It is through this oral history, this weaving of expression and creative reflection that I think activates um, what we are seeing in front of us, something that is sacred, something that is familiar. Um, as I mentioned, the land holds history, it shares knowledge and reminds us of the beauty um, that we inherently have within our surroundings. And thinking of stewardship from both a Western and indigenous point of view, um, look, I like to think about the similarities as well as the differences between those modes of um, care as well as um, with relationship to what is in front of the person. Um, and it was at this particular time in 2021, um, during the beginning of the Navajo New Year in October, that I had the opportunity to uh, venture out to cross the Navajo Nation with the team from New York uh, in support and development of up, an upcoming Navajo weaving ex exhibition. Uh, with that, um, we had an opportunity to bring a 360 camera to the reservation to try and document land in a new way through this um, technology to provide an immersive point of view of place, um, a way of knowing and relating to space and time. From that came interesting conversations about how does one have proper access or the ideal access to these locations, such as the rural landscape. Um, people may be familiar with 360 imagery by way of Google Street View, um, the Navajo Nation does have this type of imagery available to visitors as well as to community members, but not necessarily um, a perspective within the rural landscape, or in this case, Monument Valley Navajo Tribal Park. Um, and with that, just as a real quick segue, I just want to share what this view would look like um, if you were to peer into the camera itself. Um, so let me just stop my share real quick, one moment. And so here, uh, this is the project website called Shape by the Loom, which was an on, uh, physical as well as an online exhibition uh, by the Bard Graduate Center and curated by Dr. Hadley Jensen, a close friend and collaborator of mine, where we ventured clockwise to different parts of the reservation. And in this case with Monument Valley, um, this is uh, the image that we were able to uh, create. And so here is Rain God Mesa to our left or to the north. Um, and here is our team sort of peering under the, the sand dune here. Here is Byron, uh, Jesse, Hadley, and I believe myself with my vehicle um, going into the actual Navajo Tribal Park. Um, and we ventured to Canyon de Shea, uh, Ship Rock, Rinder Rock, uh, to these publicly accessible sacred places to reimagine and revitalize our relationship and ways of seeing these particular places. But just real quickly, I want to share what that um, camera was able to create from that experience. Uh, moving on, uh, the photograph here on the left is entitled the windmill. Um, the Navajo Nation itself has limited uh, accessibility to water for all Navajo Nation citizens. I Think, especially more in the more rural parts of the area. Um, but moreover, um, this particular image reminds me of home. Um, there in Hunter's Point, there is a windmill 
that um, the community would access with their livestock, um, as well as have irrigation to um, water their fields. But it's this childhood memory of the spinning windmill, hearing it in the distance and seeing um, the light reflect and refract upon the silver in the distance. And sort of this magical mirage of moments. And I imagine as you're traveling across the Navajo Nation over 27,000 square miles to see this as a positive omen, a sign of luck, especially for a horse or cattle who are venturing across the landscape looking for water. And it's interesting to me, and it's sort of something I want to uh, start investigating with recent litigation regarding um, between the Navajo Nation and the state of Arizona regarding water rights of the Colorado River. I think this is going to be an ongoing theme <clears throat> in addition to land back notions of reciprocity and healing um, that water rights will be at the forefront of those conversations with respect and, and acknowledgement of uh, climate change and global warming. To the right is a photograph entitled Loom, which was uh, documented uh, in Tonalia, Arizona, just outside the Cal Springs uh, trading post. And with in my work, I've been thinking about how the photograph itself is a vessel, a window, a facilitator, an activator of story, of memory, of teaching, of a place and time. And in the development of a Navajo weaving textile photography show titled Horizons at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, um, I had an opportunity to think about the similarities as well as the differences between these two art forms, Diné weaving and Diné photography both as windows, both as portals, both as creative expression and cultural advocacy through a particular type of medium. Um, and the trading post itself has become sort of a roadside attraction. And as you're driving along, you can't help, um, at least on the Navajo Nation, can't help but pull over and want to just admire the scenery of the everyday. Uh, this particular photograph is entitled Render Rock. Um, I, within my introduction, I mentioned which means perforated rock. And in this case, this is a close up of the detail of the actual opening within the monument. And this was created in 2018 at a particular time in my life. I had just completed my BFA at UNM. And I went to this particular spot to offer prayer and to sort of project into the future this life of creativity um, from the things that I have learned throughout um, my years at UNM and also the interesting conversations to be had back at home. Um, and with the rising sun, this is something that is offered through prayer. And it's a sacred moment in time. But whenever I hike and venture to this area, I can't help but admire the uh, natural contrast that comes from the red sandstone and the blue sky. Again, it reminds me of the opening of a Hogan when looking up through um, the roof, which is again, its own portal, its own place of prayer and projection, and the land itself can occupy a similar space. Um, Hoan, home. Home is where your heart is. Home is a space and place of belonging. It is wake walking into your grandmother's home to greet her and give her a hug. It is the smell of the fireplace walking upon the red dirt and watching the sunlight shine through the front window as KTNM plays on the radio. Growing up, I always heard that home is where your values come from. It is your foundation. It is the things within those four walls that you bring into the world and share with your relatives, your community members, employees, or in this case, um, with a virtual audience. Um, but in this way, uh, my home uh, pictured here, which is my late grandmother's home, which is now in the care and stewardship of my aunt, is a, has been a place of gathering. I can recall the laughs, the cries, the tears, the whispers and the nebizad, uh, who did what and, and where someone went. At this particular time, my family had gathered in the home to mourn the loss of my late aunt. And being a sensitive being, I removed myself from this particular location and went to the sheep corral, which was just west of this home, our homestead. And I remember it started to sprinkle and the moisture in the air started to change. And I 
remember peering back, looking east back towards our house, and there was a rainbow above it. And if you were to follow the trajectory of that rainbow, it would uh, sort of land in my grandmother's bedroom. And a month later, she had passed. And it's in this particular time that I think the photograph can sort of cement the intangible, uh, the fleeting, the ephemeral. Um, it's a moment worth reflecting and acknowledging. And it is a part of the everyday, as is our home. And looking at my home, or at least my family homestead, it is the winter sheep camp of my family, as opposed to our summer sheep camp, which is within the mountains, pictured here in the back of the, in, in the background of this image, entitled Navel. Um, within the Dene life cycle, after you were born, your mother uh, will customarily take the remnants of your umbilical cord and bury it uh, at your homestead uh, with hopes and prayers of you returning home and knowing exactly who you are and where you come from. Mine happens to be buried in my late grandparents' sheep corral. And it's from there that I return to when I need strength, foundation, guidance, or just uh, to revitalize my my hopes of of the, of the career and the things that I would like hope to like to share with my community. Um, and interestingly enough, with the photographic image, I've always looked at it as a visual blessing, something that's been offered to me, and it's up to me. I have the agency as an artist, as a storyteller, to document and preserve it, or to simply just allow it to exist, relate to it, and embody the sensibilities that come with being present in that very, very moment. And the way that we are inundated with photographic images uh, through social media, digital marketing, um, and so forth, I, I think there's a little bit more intention behind the camera um, now within my practice as opposed to when I initially began. But the values, the interests, and the passion remain the same. And in a similar way to the transformation of my practice comes the transformation of sheep. Um, sheep is life. It's a common saying here on the reservation. It, is, it provides sustenance. It teaches you discipline. Um, it provides guidance and, and it's its own sense of wealth. Um, um, and with that comes the gathering and the process of butchering a sheep, which is a very uh, I would say sacrilegious act in and of itself. It's with respect, it's with reciprocity, it's with relationship to the things that have taken care of you that are now, um, the things that you've taken care of that can now take care of you. But um, this particular image is entitled Hung to Dry. And so it is hanging sheep fat. And when I was younger, I would be tasked at the butchering to hold the sheep fat um, up to this fund so that it could be dried and then used to prepare Navajo cuisine, such as the tea. But I recall venturing to my grandmother's home late to the butchering, typical Navajo, and uh, <laughs> and um, walking in the backyard, knowing that things were done and the house was busy, and there, there this was, the hanging sheep fat. And I thought it was pretty interesting to notice that I had showed up late and they found a way to to dry it. And I began to think, looking back at that memory, who is going to be there as we grow older, as my generation grows older, as the art and process of butchering becomes a rarity, who is going to be there to hold on to these values, these teachings, or just the simple act of helping um, during such a strenuous process. Um, this is an interesting combination I like to call Mutton Star, but uh, the two separate photographs um, one on the left is mutton slab, and the one on the right is so star. Uh, the one on the left is uh, taken inside a uh, photograph created inside my grandmother's home during the butchering process itself. I find it very interesting to see the reactions and interpretations of those uh, non dene relatives or those who may not have had history or experience with sheep butchering or butchering at all. Um, it, sends, it tends to be a little jarring of an experience to have a large format photograph of mutton hanging in front of you and not necessarily knowing how to engage with it. But it's an interesting concept to me because a lot of my work is 
primarily exhibited off the Navajo Nation. And there's this internal knowledge, internal humor, this insider perspective to the small little quirks and beautiful visuals that make home so unique, particularly on the reservation. And that includes mutton with the, a you know very cheap plastic um, table, table cover. To the right is Star, which was a uh, um, sort of a detailed moment during the one of the Shiprock uh, Navajo Nation fairs uh, in the Northern Agency. It was a time when I was helping within the Navajo Nation government, and it was a moment when I got to think about my childhood and try and find the visuals and the beauty of something such as an event as the Navajo Nation Parade to be very cumbersome and uh, not necessarily being able to enjoy it as best as I'd like. Um, I think I'd like to reclaim that within the process of documenting these types of events. And from that comes this notion of home and being able to celebrate what it has to offer. Uh, this, the particular theme for the Central Agency Navajo Nation Fair in 2019 was our lives, our stories, our community, our nation. Our nation being the name of this particular photograph. Um, it was interesting to me at this time to see or to approach um, a parade float as a form of um, a mobile art installation, a mobile art exhibit on wheels uh, that represents the cultural knowledge and beauty found within the Diné cultural landscape. Pictured here is the Diné or the Navajo holy people in the form of a rainbow. Below that is the Canyon de Shea walls on, and then Spider Rock, Cornfield, and a Hogan representing an everyday moment from the Diné way of life. But living on the reservation definitely has its charms, its magic, its beauty, but also there's a certain amount of discipline and sacrifice that comes with living in the more rural parts of the reservation for sure. But I view um, the parades, the floats, the rodeos, and any type of community events on the reservation as a form of self-determination, uh, the practice of visual sovereignty, um, being able to showcase the best parts of ourselves or the things that have stood the test of time, such as our origin stories and the land that we occupy and, and the place that we call home. And since returning to the Navajo Nation since 2018, I've had the opportunity to sort of uh, implement and, and uh, incorporate my creativity into my everyday life, especially as an employee of the Navajo Nation. In 2019, during the Western Navajo Fair in Tuba City, uh, I collaborated and developed a uh, the first Navajo emoji from my perspective. So this photograph is entitled Navajo Nav emoji. Um, what, while working with the Division of Human Resources, my supervisor wanted to showcase and celebrate customer service on the reservation. And I asked, what would you like to put on the float? She said, oh, just throw a smiley face up there. And I thought, okay, well, that's a good idea, but why can't we indigenize that? Why aren't we, as an indigenous people, one particular tribe in this case, represented in technology in this type of way, these uh, uh, future-based visuals, so to speak. And so we decided to take inspiration from Ashki Happy, uh, this, Navajo emoji has a Navajo brim hat with a brown leather strap, complete with silver conchos and a sille, which is a traditional Navajo hair bun. And I, it, although a small act and something that was created within our home, our, I'm sorry, within the office and with the support of our employees, it was an opportunity to bring that creativity, this sense of light and joy that uh, my home has offered me and bring it back into the community as a form of reciprocity. Um, sort of like recycling the good vibes that you receive from your relatives. And I think this is something I would like again to invest in as a as an artist is thinking of mobile pop-up events on across the Navajo Nation that don't necessarily fall into the schedule of the fairs 
but um, finding new ways to bring creativity to my community and meet them halfway where they're already at. Um, the next theme here, ke, ke, or kinship, ke, is love. Ke, is community, it is connection, it is the matrilineal, uh, it is it is the matriarchs within your family. But ke for me is the foundation upon which I stand. Um, it is through ke uh, that I wanted to acknowledge my grandparents at the beginning of this particular um, oops, at the beginning of this particular presentation. And it is something that I hope um, my relatives can understand that it is not necessarily, or maybe not understand, but be reminded that our connection to our relatives is not limited to humans. Um, our clans come from the elements. Our stories come from the elements. We have origin stories of rainbows as tools, as ways of transportation. We have stories of clouds and rains and, and songs and prayers associated with this. I think this is an opportunity, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic, to be reminded of those relationships, those forms of connection. Uh, this particular photograph has the backdrop of this theme is internal which is a close-up detail of a drying sheepskin in my friend's backyard. It is through Ke that we're able to access particular spaces, whether it is the intimate, the personal, or the communal, or in this case, um, the virtual. There are definitely different ways to relate and understand our surroundings. This particular photograph commemorates and celebrates uh, was created in Denohoto in 2018. It represents a time of love in my life. And as a Dene artist, I recall um, receiving a question as to why love was a part of the title of my talk. And I thought it was pretty funny, but I figured that it was a legitimate inquiry. But I thought it is through love. It is through love for myself, my family, my community, from where I come from that I am able to speak and share and document and preserve what I find of value. And it's through love and in this case that I was able to see this particular scene in my um, ex-boyfriend's backyard. His family was having a gathering and celebrating the birthday of a, uh, a young relative. And I, you know, if you're a good in-law, you would go in and help and, and pitch in where you could. Uh, but there was interesting dynamics and I offered um, to take a photograph of a few things here and there. And there in the backdrop were um, hanging mutton ribs. And, and I thought that is the shot. And I remember asking for consent and permission to document this, but it began this interesting concept in my mind of thinking as, eh, as access, kinship as trust, as forms of accessing different parts of our lives that we uh, that we share, that we hold dear to ourselves, but also as a means of documenting and preserving the beautiful interactions that we have with um, our family members in the form of gathering and surrounding. In the same way that these ideas have started with walking outside my grandmother's back door. And walking out that back door, um, especially during a sheep butchering, uh, I came across a stray res dog. This was at the time, uh, this is referencing the photograph on the left. This was at a time when my grandmother had passed and the family out of respect uh, gave our homestead some space to heal, to rest. And when we reunited in this space, we butchered to celebrate our livelihoods and, and to catch up. And again, I walked outside with my camera and there was a dog with a sheep head. And I thought this was a beautiful image. And I remember walking up to him. I assume it was a male dog at the time. And the tail went between his legs out of fear. But you wouldn't know it by, his, by the dog's expression that there was another dog adjacent to me on my left, which is what he, this particular creature is snarling at and sort of becoming aggressive and protective of the sheep head that it has. I thought this was an interesting visual um, representation of the notion of survivance by indigenous um, uh, philosopher Gerald Bisner. 
um, in terms of surviving and resistance um, occurring in tandem with one another. Uh, I think the epidemic of um, res dogs on the Navajo Nation is definitely something that should be addressed, but due to limited resources and overpopulation, if it's a part of the everyday and it is synonymous with the way that we view this situation is synonymous with how we approach or avert our gaze from unsheltered relatives. I think through eh, there's an intent to empathize and understand what our surroundings and the beings that are within those surroundings have to offer us. Um, but moreover, I keep thinking about our relationships to our non-human relatives and the elements as a way to be present, to, to listen, really, to receive and, and, and hopefully learn and advocate for something different. Now, the photograph on the right is Censor My Census, uh, which is a photograph of the uh, exterior of the uh, Navajo Office of Vital Records and Identification and Render Off. It's where you would go to get your certificate of Indian blood, your CIB. Um, and referencing the bureaucratic system of the Navajo Nation tribal government, uh, I thought it was pretty comical to have this slow sign in front of this, this uh, institution of sorts. Um, but referencing it back to kinship, I've heard eh, or kinship does not discriminate. There are conversations and pushes to legalize same-sex marriage across the Navajo Nation and that this is something that is both personal and something I am passionate about as a former board member for Tudan Pride, but to think about equity and equality from an internal perspective. Um, indigenous people, similar to animals and livestock are, are the only people on the, on the, in the world who have to prove their, their, their ethnicity through blood quantum and to be, to enroll as a Navajo Nation tribal member, you have to have a fourth um, Navajo blood and be a direct descendant of a relative from the 1940s census roll. And while working next to this particular building, I used to think, what happened to those individuals who decided for one reason or another not to enroll at this particular time? And from that one decision, their relatives, um, their descendants are not, don't have the same rights or opportunity to enroll and receive the same benefits of being recognized at the federal level as a Dene tribal citizen. It is a slow process, is it a process of reflection? And I imagine the identity politics of this will continue to expand and expound as we move into the 21st century. Um, from that, uh, we can have these conversations and become a beacon for a new way of understanding. This particular photograph is entitled Emergence, which was a roadside snapshot out in Mexican water, Arizona. <clears throat> One of the many trips I would take from Render Rock to um, my ex's house in the Western Agency of the Navajo Nation. Um, but Again, as you're driving across the reservation, you cannot help but want to pull over and take a photograph of what you are seeing. Uh, this is the, obviously an abandoned satellite with a gorilla style uh, Navajo basket design adhered to it. It is a form of creative placemaking. It is its own indigenous aesthetic, an aesthetic indigenous to site, indigenous to culture, and indigenous to the aesthetic itself. And as we continue to relate to our surroundings, our surroundings relate to us in new different ways as we choose to understand it. Obviously, you could engage with this particular photograph through the geological features of rapidly modifying, or you could be an inspired artist, visual, or in this case, a weaver who could pull design elements from the geological formation, uh, such as a wedge weave in Diné culture. Below that is To or the San Juan River which ventures across um, the borders of the Navajo Nation through New Mexico and Utah, eventually uh, merging with the Colorado River in Arizona. And thinking about uh, my relatives' backyards, their places of home and how they relate to landmarks, this is entitled 
Standing Red Rock, which is the English translation of the Bene place name. It is site specific, site as an S-I-T-E, site as an S-I-G-H-T. Um, the photographic image, at least within my work, allows one to be present and occupy the space of the photographer myself in hopes of understanding and relating to what's in front of them. Uh, and the last thing here, Ina, life. Uh, life goes on, and similar to uh, the use of sheep within our livelihoods as Dene, it transforms, it changes, it provides different teaching stories, memories, and forms of engaging and communicating with the world. And going back to my childhood, I was always raised with sheep. There was always sheep around, thanks to my grandfather, my grandmother. And I think for a long time, I took advantage of that, thinking that it was always going to be there, and especially as they passed. Um, their flock was given to us to steward and take care. And in fall of 2022, as I was going between Rinder Rock and Phoenix, um, our flock was, uh, the corral with our flock was invaded by some stray res dogs and they attacked them and we no longer have that flock or at least the direct descendants of the initial flock that my grandfather started. Um, and with that came the acknowledgement of the temporality of life and trying to be present and hold gratitude for those everyday moments. And it is something you want to freeze. It's something you want to sort of maintain, preserve, and hope that it doesn't change. But similar to the seasons on Navajo, something can be frozen, such as this particular image of a waterfall just outside of Hunter's Point, where I'm from. Um, but it is also a moment to reflect and know that the only thing that is constant within the world is change. Bluebird Backyard, this photograph is taken in my, my backyard here in Render Rock. It was created during the COVID-19 pandemic when we were on lockdown and we had to turn inwards toward the intimate, toward the personal and try and preserve those smaller moments. My mom is a pretty good fry bread maker, one of the best that I know. You ask any Navajo and they say their mom is also the, the best fry bread maker that they have. But she likes to collect these bluebird flower bags. And the bluebird itself is a positive omen. And this particular image has become a patch, uh, sort of a Diné symbol of sorts, its own aesthetic that uh, brings uh, good vibes for sure. Uh, moving a little quickly here with respect to time, this photograph is entitled Leadership. Um, this was in, is in reference to the homestead of my former supervisor who taught me a lot about leadership, about what it meant to be not um, during a uh, global pandemic, during within a tribal government trying to understand this new feature or this new um, occurrence within all of our lives. It was a particular time when we ventured out to her homestead and documented where she came from, the teachings that helped her get to this particular moment in time to serve the Navajo people. I think this is a memory that I like to look back on often. And it is through this projection and prayer of Tadadin and Corn Pollen that we can share and advocate for the future, uh, which is Tadadin Tales here on the left. And to the right is a photograph I entitled Wushdan, which is a former doorway to a particular shade house at my friend's place. And as I referenced, um, change is the only thing that it's constant. The way that we engage and enter into space is always changing. And it's through that space that we should enter with love and respect, with reverence, um, with reciprocity. And from the base of the Shiprock Pinnacle, this is where I've offered prayer in the past, similar to the other locations that I've documented. But this is where I want to sort of wrap up my presentation and hope that I've offered or at least informed and inspired a sense of inspiration of the many um, ideas that the land, our home, our connections with community and our life have to offer. Yeah, Saga, thank you very much. And just real quickly, here are some brief resources um, for those who are interested in Diné photography, as well as some of the topics that I've shared and discussed throughout this presentation. Thank you. Um, wow, that that was beautiful. Thank thank you so much. Yeah, there's there's a lot of comments coming across the chat. Just 
um, yeah, how introspective and uh, eloquent you are with with not only your your eye as a photographer, but but your use of of language and speech and um, r really appreciate that. That was that was fantastic. So I'll have to. I'm still getting my head wrapped around quite a bit of, of it. So I'll have to watch that a couple of times. And I'm sure some, some new revelation is going to hit me every time. So um, thank you again. Um, I just jotted, I was just jotting down a couple of notes here as you went. I wanted to um, highlight a, a phrase you used, um, which was the magical mirage of moments. Um, and just, yeah, I don't I don't know if I have a question. I just wanted to kind of highlight that um, as a beautiful use of, of language. Is that something that you use often or is, was that something that you just kind of came up with in, in the in the moment as you were speaking? It's a recent idea. Um, I've been trying to write a little bit more. I think I have um, a lot of comfort in speaking very informally about my ideas. Um, so trying to play with words a little bit more, a lot of the titles within the photographs that I create uh, use um, words to provide some sense of context or direction that could kind of lead them a little bit. Um, but normally I think of uh, the work that I do and what I am seeing and documenting as visual blessings. Um, so a magical mirage of moments, I think, is something similar to that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question is, you know, we you were making connections between different, you know, art forms, weaving, photography. Um, and I was I was going to ask if there was any other uh, mediums that you like to express your creativity. It sounds like writing is is one of them. Um, are there any other other ways that that you or things that you identify with uh, as a creator? I think um Holistically, it is hiking. I know it's not necessarily its own art form, but when I think of creative expression, I think of it as freedom. I see it as belonging and embrace and a chance to be present with the things that inspire you or the thoughts and memories that are going through your mind. And I think being out in the land, it's a no judgment free zone, right? It allows, it embraces you, it holds you. And from that safe space, you can sort of reflect and, and ponder on those thoughts. Um, but in addition to hiking, I do um, some graphic design lately to try and visualize my ideas. I say I sketch a lot, and that's uh, through text, and that's through jotting things down um, and also speaking into my phone. Um, I think becoming a better storyteller is uh, sort of the thing that I want to invest in as my medium. Yeah, on that note, I, I just saw a question come uh, through the Q&A, um, just asking if if we may ask what it means to be one who walks around um, in, in that kind of vein as a hiker and a creator and a photographer. Um, is there anything more you want to want to speak to there? Um, one who walks around is the my maternal uh, clan. Um, as a matrilineal society, it is also my mother's clan, my grandmother's clan, and so forth, which is who I am as a Dene person. From a larger context, um, it is one of the original four clans uh, as part of our origin stories as Dene. And I think that is an opportunity to be an advocate or sort of um, someone who promotes that, that part of our Dene identity. But being one who walks around and literally doing that with my camera has been uh, a beautiful acknowledgement uh, to sort of ground me in what I am doing, how I am speaking, what I am sharing. Um, but it also think, I think it's just naturally within me. I mean, growing up um, with the sage, fields of sage, the red hills in my backyard, having no limits, I just, I just had to explore and I, I keep that true to me now. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, a couple of folks, you know, you're talking about walking around with your camera. I guess there's a, a few people that are just interested in the day to day. of What kind of equipment are you using? Um, do you have a camera with you basically everywhere you go, just in case a good opportunity comes up? Uh, what does that look like for you? Great question. I think um, we always have our phone, right? So we always have a camera with us. Um, and we can take screenshots as a form of, of recording, right, so quickly. 
but I use a digital DSLR camera that I have with me most times. I have a drone um, um, that I will use to get different vantage points. I'm working on a body of work through that type of technology as well. Um, but my roots, my foundation is with a black and white um, 35 millimeter Pentex camera. I was part of the school newspaper in middle school that really developed my eye for that. Um, but prior to that, I've had disposable cameras I would take on class trips and I would use them before I even go went on the trip, which is a funny memory I had as a child. But, um, you know, I think knowing that we have this capability to always document and share now through technology, um, I try to be a little bit more, have a little bit more intention of doing it. And again, looking at a visual blessing, sometimes the things you're seeing within the world or experiencing are just for you. Mm -hmm. And I think you should respect that, hold that close to you, because now we don't have to remember as, as much as we we have technology to tell us how to remember. Sure. So whenever I do come across those occurrences with that are really beautiful and special, I hold it dear to me because I want to be able to remember that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it seems like you know, there, you, you don't seem to do a lot of portrait um, photography and that that might just be what you decided to to present to us here today. Um, what is the dynamic um, on on the nation as far as like t taking photos of people? Um, have you chose to do landscapes and some more of these um, artistic, you know, the floats and things um, as as your own creative choice? Or um, would you like to do more por portraits? Uh, I, I, I term my work as the documentation of the cultural landscape, but I also look at it as portraits of the everyday life of my home community. Although there is not a human body more often than not present within my work, you cannot deny that there is a human existence and presence, not necessarily just me as the photographer, but you'll sort of see um, sheep corrals, homes, gravel, and I I think um, with me, I, I, you know, I grew up taking photographs of my friends in high school and, and we would experiment with that. But I started to, especially as I turned inward and started spending a lot more time with myself, I started looking at the colors, the designs, and sort of the artistic elements that are found within my surroundings and that can be replicated or at least represented within the image. There's something tactile and beautiful about that. And I think there are a lot of great, then they have portrait photographers out there that are doing great work, but it doesn't necessarily interest me. I think creating portraits of the land and trying to emulate um, my relationship to space, something that is intangible, intangible such as light, as language, as culture, as history. If I can use the photographic image to try and at least make that a reality, um, I think that's the goal. And that could be itself its own portrait. Yeah, absolutely. What an amazing answer. Um, so I'm trying to formulate a question out of this, but I'm just going to kind of make an observation and then maybe we can just have a conversation about it. It seems like there was a theme a couple of times. Um, you know, you talked about the butchering of sheep as being, uh, I think you used the word sacrilegious or, you know, kind of a destructive process, but trying to find beauty in that. Um, you talked about trying to reclaim some of the joy that you have um, with trying to balance that with the responsibility that you feel to document these things. Um, and then the other one that I kind of tied into that, and I don't know if I'm way off base here, is the dog with the sheep head. Um, so it seems like there was a few images where you, you know, you brought up this dichotomy between something that might on its surface be destructive or not healthy, but trying to balance that with life and love and, and language and those kinds of things. Thank you for that observation. I, I think the images that are powerful in that way, I, I look at it as trying to visualize the concept of Bajon or beauty and balance, a visual harmony, if you will, with both an internal and external perspective that brings two stories together to have a fuller or more extensive understanding of that particular moment. You know, and that comes from 
being at, uh, at UNM and hearing you can't, a photograph has a thousand words, sure, but you can't stand there and defend it and provide that content and context so that someone can actually receive what you're hoping to share. And I said, well, for a long time that bothered me. And I thought, well, I'm going to reclaim that because our history, our way of communicating within um, Indian country and, and the indigenous cultures of the world is oral. It is, it is temporary, it is ever-changing, it is alive, it is moving. And I believe the ways that we engage and understand the visual is can be viewed in the same, in, in, viewed and engaged with in the same way. Um, so it's a balancing act. And I think it's every time I go back to a particular photograph, there is something new that I can give to it or something new that I'm seeing from it. And it's just this reciprocal bond that I have with the visual and so a lot of this work I've been doing for over six years, but it always teaches me something. And to be able to share that on the anniversary of my late grandmother's birthday, where a lot of this perspective and, and, and my, my foundation has allowed me to be present in this very moment was important to me. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who took the time to listen and to, to hear me out. Yeah, th thank you so much. And um... Yeah, you said your grandmother's name was Marie Tabaha? Yeah. So um, can you speak a little to, if if you want to, just uh, um, kind of her inspiration and her her place in your life as you were growing up? Sure. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about a project that I have um, this coming summer. It's called All Res. It's a mobile traveling photography exhibition that will venture across the different agencies on Navajo um, slated for June of this year. It's a homecoming of sorts. But um, I was thinking about the place that I would like to approach that work. And I said, well, it would be through um, the sensibility of giving a warm hug and embrace from my late grandmother, just to feel that. I would want people or people who engage with my work to sort of get a sensibility of that. Um, but she was a weaver. She was a school board member. Um, she was very stern. She was a strong woman. She was a leader in her own regard. Um, and that being my lineage of being a descendant of her and my grandfather, I feel a certain responsibility to that, not necessarily as just a Dines citizen, but as an artist, as an employee, as a, as a good relative, as a future ancestor, a future elder, right? Um, I think about the seven generation principle, three generations before you, the current three generations after, this ontological presence that we each have an opportunity to engage with on a daily basis. And, you know, with respect to my grandmother, her being a weaver, I hear stories about that, sheep dipping, shearing, I hear stories of my grandfather being a botanist and bringing down medicinal and ceremonial plants from, you know, our backyard to help dye wool, to help heal his relatives, his family. And, you know, not everyone has a land base to reference within their life, but knowing I have one and I'm blessed in that way, but it's this ongoing um, calling to, to document it, to celebrate it, to share it. And not necessarily to say that this is what I have, but that this is, there are small parts of these universal ideas of home, life, kinship, and land that we all can take from or at least engage with. And I just want to remind people that we all inherently have that. And it's all we have to do is look and listen. Yeah, that one just on a personal note, it's, it's uh, very close to home for me. I was really close to my grandmother as well. And um, she was a big fan of roosters, so I have a couple of roosters around the house. So she she keeps an eye on me. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think we've maybe got time for one more. Um, another observation I made was uh, uh, another theme of windows. So you talked about weaving as being a window, and the the lens of a, of a camera being a window. Um, you know, you took a photo of window rock. Are there any other places on the landscape or, or tools um, that you kind of would lump into that category of a, of a window? I think of um, my second clan, Tabaha, which is Water's Edge. Uh, I can't swim, 
uh, or I'm not a great swimmer. So I spend a lot of my time at the bank or the shore. But when I was thinking about the elemental relationship that I have to my clan's water's edge, when you're standing at the shore and looking at, say, a lake, it's constantly moving, it's constantly changing, and you can see your reflection. I think the window, glass, the lens, portals, openings, water, um, these types of themes within my work are um, points of reflection. And, and that's what I mentioned by it being site-specific, site as an S-I-T-E as a place, and site in terms of your perspective. Again, okay. playing on those those words and trying to find a harmony between those relationships. Yeah, um, beautiful. Just just as the the entire talk was, and um, we just yeah really appreciate your time. Um, I've got more more chat compliments than I've seen um, in a very long time. Just uh, yeah, speaking to your your eloquence and your um, your perspectives, and just thanking you for your time. So. Um, yeah, I think, you know, with respect to time, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, but yeah, please let us know if you're ever up in the area, uh, we would love to meet you in person and, um, give you a, give you a rundown of Crow Canyon and, uh, bring your camera up. We've got some good, uh, good vantage points and things to see up there too. So. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great evening. Nice meeting you guys. I'm going to. Okay. Be well. See ya.